So in this video, I want to talk us through the different types of force that you're likely to meet. OK, so this isn't an exhaustive list of all of the different forces, but we'll give you an idea of where we're going. OK, so I kind of want to do a little bit of introduction here to make sure you're clear on each of these. Um, so let's start off with weight. So back when I did a video on the SI units, um, I introduced weight and explained that there is a difference between mass and weight. Now, due to the English language, you know, from day to day, we often use mass and weight um, synonymously. Um, but if you were to measure my mass, um, then it is the same both here on the Earth as it would be on the Moon. There is only so much of me, and the mass calculates that. Whereas the weight, I would weigh differently on the Moon as I would on the Earth. Okay? I am heavier, I weigh heavier on the Earth rather than the Moon because of the lack of gravity. Okay? So there is more, there is greater gravity uh, from the Earth because uh, itself has a larger mass. Um, so I won't go too far down that road, but just so you're clear that those two things are the different. So weight, uh, which we often write as W, is given by the mass of an object times by G, gravity. Okay. Now G here isn't representing grams. Okay, it's representing uh, the acceleration due to gravity. Now, on the Earth, G is approximated a few different ways, depending on how accurate um, the problem is. Sometimes um, it is uh, written as 10 metres per second per second. Okay, that's probably the most inaccurate uh, version of it that we quite often use. Okay, uh, a more refined model is g is equal to 9.8 meters per second per second. That's the one that I will generally use. Okay, um, unless I've said otherwise. Or a slightly more refined model, g equals 9.81 meters per second per second. Okay. Now, ordinarily, a question will tell you which uh, you're going to use. That, but that does depend on the exam board. So, for example, AQA will tell you uh, the value of G at the beginning of the question. Um, while uh, OCR, for example, will put um, that G is 9.8 metres per second per second on the front of the paper unless it is otherwise stated in the question. Okay, So you've just got to keep an eye out. So that G there is kind of one of those. right? OK, so that's weight. Now, let's have a think about the normal reaction. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw uh, a box on a table. OK, there's my box on a table. Now, the weight of the box works vertically downwards. OK, so the weight as I'm pressing into the ground is going vertically downwards to the centre of the Earth. OK, and that's how we're going to label it. So the W equals the mass of the object of the box times gravity G. Now, the normal reaction force is the force that is stopping me from sinking through the floor. Okay? So, whereas I am um, pressing my weight down on the floor, the floor isn't giving way. Okay? I'm not sinking through. So, in order to keep me in position, the floor is acting upwards with a normal reaction force, okay, which is equal and opposite to the one that I am pressing down. Okay? 
So the normal reaction force, often written as R, always works uh, perpendicular to the plane. Okay, so whereas W will always work vertically downwards, R will work perpendicular to the plane. Now, that then causes there to be a discrepancy when the box is on an inclined surface, for example. Okay, so let's say we have a slope, and here is the box. Now, I'll just rewrite that theta, so there's theta. Now the weight will work vertically downwards, whereas the normal reaction force will be perpendicular to the plane. Okay? So that is where uh, the difference lies there. And what you can start to kind of imagine is that um, if I had this box um, on this slope, then if there was nothing uh, to stop it from slipping down, then that's exactly what would happen. Weight, its weight would pull the box down the slope, okay? Uh, unless there is something in the way. And that is friction, okay? So one possible resistive force can be friction. So if you're trying to apply um, some force to this box and you're trying to push it across the ground, then what's going to happen is that, you know, if you're trying to put uh, some push or you're pulling the uh, box along the ground, then there will be a frictional force that works against the direction of motion. Okay? So, if we have this situation, uh, then the friction will work up the slope, okay? Now, what we're looking at here is if, if, this, if this friction exists in these two situations, then we're looking at a rough surface, okay? So, if the situation was the case that it, we had a rough surface, then we would have friction. If it's defined as a smooth surface, then, of course, that friction won't be there. Now, you'll encounter different frictions depending upon the uh, situation and depending upon the uh, problem. So if I'm trying to push a box across carpet, I'll have much, a much harder time than if I was trying to push that box across ice. So different surfaces will ha cause different frictions. And they have attributed to them uh, what's referred to as the coefficient of friction, which we call mu. So imagine that we have this box on, um, on a rough surface. OK, I'm trying to push this box again across a carpeted floor, for example. OK, and I apply a little bit of pressure, and the box resists that motion. Okay, the friction uh, that I'm experiencing is too great. So, in that case, what we find is that the friction is the frictional force is less than the coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal reaction force. Okay, so that friction that's working against me, okay, is less than mu times r. So what you ne then need to imagine is that I'm pushing that box, and I apply a little bit more pressure, okay? And now I, the box is just on the point of tipping, okay? Just on the point of moving. At that point, the box is in limiting equilibrium, as it's referred to, okay? And at that point, the box is just about to move, and the friction force, when it starts moving, is equal to the coefficient of friction times the normal reaction force. Okay? So that's something with friction that we're going to have to deal with later on uh, when we come around to it. So that's just really introducing it here. Now another resistive force uh, that we've got to deal with quite often is air resistance. Okay? So air resistance, like friction, will work 
opposite to the direction of motion. Okay, um, so air resistance um, is ignored if we are dealing with uh, a point mass or um, a particle. Okay, so unless the question specifically says that there is air resistance being included. Okay, of course, if you had a situation where you've got um, a parachutist, then air resistance has to be taken into account. Okay. Now, let's have a look at tension. Now, tension and thrust are kind of linked, okay? Um, tension we deal with in many more cases um, in this section than we do thrust, okay? Tension is the force that is trying to um, pull an object back into its original position. Okay. Now, the idea for that would be that let's say we had um, a car. So we've got a car and we've got a trailer. Okay. Then if we looked at the car and the trailer, there would be a tension in the tow bar, okay? So the tow bar we'll be thinking of as a, a rigid body, okay? Um, and the tension will be working in that, in that direction in order to try and pull these two objects back into their original position, okay? So the tension uh, we'll be looking at in quite a number of problems. It's also coming up in pulleys. So if you've got a pulley and you've got two weights attached at either end uh, of a bit of string, okay, and the string is taut, then there will be tension in that string, okay, trying to pull those uh, blocks back so that there's no kind of stretch. So that's, that's the kind of idea, is trying to pull those two objects back together. Whereas thrust, or often referred to as compression, is trying to push the object back. Okay, so quite often uh, that kind of idea comes up when something has been compressed. So if you have a spring, okay, and you press it down, then there is this force trying to push the spring back into its original position, into its original form. So thrust and compression, they don't come up an awful lot in that sense unless um, the situation changes and uh, with the tension. And sometimes um, problems can work, uh, the tension can be pushing in the other direction as well. Okay, and hence becomes thrust and compression. So sometimes you will see those kind of problems dealt with in those situations as well, but more often than not, it's tension. So this has been kind of like a whistle-stop tour of the different, some of the different forces that you're going to um, have a look at in this section. Um, so really, just uh, keep going with the videos as you pick up these new ideas, take note of them, write them down, um, and then you can always come back to this video to kind of get an all-encompassing view.